Welcome to the Art of Procurement podcast. My name is Philip Heidson, a 20-year procurement practitioner, former head of procurement and advisor to procurement leaders around the world. I started out of procurement to help leaders and their teams access the resources they need to increase their impact through insight-driven procurement. You are listening to our flagship podcast where we pull back the curtain and shine a light on the strategies, tactics, and tools that leading procurement teams are using to align their impact with the needs of their business. And in today's podcast, I'm joined by three different guests. Michael Denari, who actually goes by Denari in the podcast, as you'll hear, the head of procurement at Canva, Liam Hua, the head of strategic sourcing at Hopin, and Rajul Zapadi, the co-founder and CEO at Zip Intake to Procure. Now, this podcast is a recording of a recent AOP Live webinar that was sponsored by Zip, Titled Improving Internal Perception of Procurement from Intake to Procure, we discussed with the panelists the challenge of increasing the perception of procurement. We then dig down into how to provide more seamless buying experience for stakeholders, especially at the beginning of the procurement process when they first have a need to buy a product or service. And let's go straight into the webinar at the point where I ask the panelists to share a little bit about their background, starting with asking Liam if he found procurement or if procurement found him. Um, I think 100% procurement chose me, although I think I've always been sort of a natural or uh, somewhat natural sort of person who likes to negotiate just in general. But, uh, you know, my story began, I was at a, I went back to grad school because I, I, I majored in Chinese and found out I didn't make any money studying Chinese. Right. And, uh, I went back to business school um, and didn't know what I wanted to be in business school either, but um, I was at a job fair. And one of those large MBA job fairs, and I was just standing in front of the Procter and Gamble, you know, booth, debating on whether or not I should grab the Head and Shoulders bottle of shampoo or not to put in my my Chachki's bag. And uh, someone from procurement had come up to me and said, "Hey, are you interested in uh, purchasing?" Which just happened to be right. The pamphlet was in front of me as well. Yeah. And I said, um, I looked at him and said, "Absolutely." And and I had no idea what it was at the time because I was, you know, in the morning I was project management. By mm-hmm. mid morning I was finance. By somewhere, you know, early afternoon, I was something else. And so by that point in time, I just said, sure, I'm in procurement as well. But uh, and so I think that's how it found me just by accident. Mm-hmm. And, and what's your journey been since then? So uh, once you got into procurement, have you stuck in procurement or is it kind of a, a, a circular direction back to uh, to what you're doing today? Yeah, I mean, I had a brief uh, I had a brief break in nonprofit, but I always came back to uh, to procurement sourcing after that. And so I, I would say for the for almost my entire career, I've been here. And it's been a journey for sure. Um, Denari, I'm going to ask you exactly the same question. How did you find yourself in procurement? Yeah, I can definitely relate to maybe there being some underpinnings uh, earlier in my life. Uh, my brother went to uh, NYU uh, and he's four years older than me. And so when we go visit, we go to Chinatown. And I just remember hustling for fake Rolexes and uh, you know walking away from the street vendors to have them chasing me down and getting a lot of satisfaction out of that. But um, out of college, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I, I did accounting as just kind of a business finance guy and just finding whatever I could. And um, it's actually a funny story uh, of kind of things coming full circle. But what attracted me to procurement was uh, one particular guy on the other side of the floor for me uh, just doing some badass negotiations and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and that appealing to me and being like, that sounds like a lot cooler than what I'm doing. Um, and he mentored me and um, it's actually somebody who's starting uh, to lead my strategic sourcing team, uh, awesome. you know, here eight, eight to 10 years later, life kind of comes full circle um, to get the band back together for what originally got me passionate about procurement. Um, and yeah, uh, it's been in procurement since kind of building out uh, and scaling teams at, uh, in the technology uh, sector. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to tapping into both of your uh, experiences from a procurement practitioner side over the next 45, 50 minutes or so. Uh, Rajul, I'm going to come to you, and, and you're a little bit of the outlier in terms of not having the uh, the practitioner experience and coming to procurement from a different angle. I wonder if you could talk about kind of why procurement became something that you became you know passionate enough to really want to start a company to support. Yeah, yeah, it was it was sort of two part for for me. So uh, Zip is Zip is company number two for me. Before this, uh, was the co-founder and CEO of a totally unrelated company uh, called Flight Car. So we would give you airport parking by renting out your car to someone else, fully insured. And you know, I, I dropped out of college to to start that company. I ran the company for 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 four years, um, but at our peak, we were about 200 people. And I remember having this problem around. 
having zero insight or visibility really into what was getting spent, where it was getting spent, why it was getting spent. Uh, and, and that's a spend issue, but also like a, a sort of a compliance issue too from you know the software that we were buying and, and, and so forth. Um, and then after, after uh, we sold the company Mercedes and I worked at Airbnb for, for a couple of years and I worked in, in product management, um, but in my job, I interfaced a lot with my counterparts in procurement and in sourcing. And you know, one of the biggest pain points was for an end user in the business, if you just need something, you need some software, you want to hire a contractor, like what's the one front door? You know, what's the one place you go to initiate this request without needing to be trained on it? Uh, and then how does that get tracked across all the cross-functional teams? So from the budget approval to, of course, procurement, sourcing, IT, maybe data security, often legal, right? All these different parties before making its, you know, making the, before the request makes, makes its way to the financial system on the back end, it was just so manual. And, and the procurement person that I used to work with, uh, he used to joke with me, he was like, you know, I feel like my job is that of an air traffic cop. Like all right. I'm trying to do is land all these different planes at, you know, different times, but it's not strategic and it's not high leverage, uh, but but someone's got to, someone's got to do it. And so that was ultimately the inspiration to, to start ZIP. And and really focus on sort of the upstream procurement processes around intake to procure. Now, now you are coming in from, um, you know, from the perspective you had, it's interesting that you're kind of solving a challenge that you had with another organization because you saw that kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. How, from your experience, do you see that procurement is currently perceived? And this can be from, you know, your experience before, but also, you know, you speak to a lot of folks within procurement and the challenges that you have. What are you hearing on the street? Yeah, I think one of the the challenges that people seem to seem to face, and, and curious to get Liam and, and Denari's feedback on yeah. some of this too, is you know when there isn't visibility to the requester on sort of exactly what the process is going to be like, you know where is it bottlenecked? Uh, because often you know something might just be bottlenecked because the vendor hasn't responded back uh, uh, to legal or to another internal party. But the problem is if there isn't visibility then the, the only party that, you know, unfortunately holds the blame is the party that, that the requester can see. Uh, and so, that, you know, they can see procurement, they understand, you know, that actually there's complexity around this, we need multiple reviews. Um, and procurement in many cases with some of these requests is just is helping manage this process, but, uh, but they're not, you know, directly holding anything up by any means. Um, and, and, you know, if that visibility is lacking, then, then unfortunately it doesn't, set up the, the function um, to be to be successful and and it's unfair uh, uh too but it's it's you know a lot of you know sort of unfortunately i think some of the pattern that, that i've i've seen and that the company has seen but i'm curious to hear both uh both of your thoughts around sort of what you know what you felt in your in the past and careers or at least what you've seen too yeah and, and now if you want to jump in on that yeah happy to I, I mean, similar feeling. I think uh, you know, at my last gig, building out the, kind of the procurement function at at Procore, uh, from you know, 600 employees to a little bit over 2,000. Um, you know, we had to hack together Jira as an as an intake on top of Coupa as a PR tool because PR tools aren't really built for this modern world of you got to get eight teams involved and they're talking to other systems. And so Jira was our way to try to project manage all of that. Um, and and I, like it's so painful to see really talented sourcing managers um, spend a ton of their time doing uh, like nonsense administration work of copy pasting from one field to another system, get to legal, um, and then like you know your performance almost suffers if you're disorganized as a sourcing manager, which like organization is a key skill, but at the same time it's like oh you forgot to get this notification from another system and bring it back into Jira. Like those are the things that just would would make me boil a little bit about like God, there's got to be some way better than this. Um, and uh, yeah, I think like that, that's really the crux of the issue. Um, that I've felt in, uh, in you know, my prior roles. Yeah, I mean, I think I would piggyback on it in the sense that, um, you know, sourcing people always feel like we're engaged too late, right? Like, why didn't you engage me sooner? You know, I'm much more, I have larger impact the sooner you engage me or the function in general. But I think it's uh, part of that problem is that for especially newer companies and some established companies that have never put an emphasis on procurement or sourcing as a function is that they brought the function in too late, right? Mm -hmm. The function never existed when accounting existed, didn't exist when finance existed. And so when all of a sudden cost savings becomes an initiative, maybe we should create this sourcing or procurement organization if they're not already like a CPG company that's always focused on it, right? 
And so when you don't see the function as core to the business, it's very difficult to evangelize and get the traction you need. And just continuously, you know, if you're at an older organization that wasn't CPG or whatnot, sort of your battle every year is how do I get more stakeholder engagement? That's your, it's much different from like creating an organization from ground up, which I think is most people's problems. Like how do I stay relevant or make people understand I'm relevant? But, you know, the interesting thing is that on, from like an accounting perspective or like an AP perspective, all the stuff you want happens upstream, right? Because you're always getting this distinct, this rolling rock coming down you that has everything you don't want when the invoice comes through. And people start from AP and they start to build backwards incrementally to figure out like, how do I get everything in place? And a lot of times it stops at the procure to pay portion, right? Like, all right, I've got the no PO, no pay policy in place. Now I'm golden. Like everything should now happen correctly. But then you're still just getting invoices and telling somebody, hey, go open a PO so I can match it, right? You're never getting full enough upstream where payment terms are negotiated, right? Where security is reviewed, where everybody's involved, where budgets are approved, where budget or like the requirements are gathered to say what's going to come downhill. And I think the sooner that you can get all the way up front there and think of it more from you know, because you don't like from a selling perspective, you don't think like order to cash at, mm -hmm. to start with. Right. And so people are always thinking quoting in advance then order to cash. So in the same respect, you need to think about buying from that perspective as well. You need to go all the way upstream and make sure downstream it's coming down clean. Um, and if it doesn't, then you're always every year saying how to become more relevant in this company. I don't like I don't understand why people don't see me as relevant or how do I get more stakeholder engagement? Because um, at the end of the day, it's like really doesn't matter if my stakeholder likes me or not from my perspective, right? Like I, I perform a function at this company, whether you like me or not, right? And so uh, and that's really the sort of the attitude that I think people should shift towards in my, in my opinion. And, and I guess just to like, like jump on to that, because obviously that's such a common theme in our industry of, I need to be further upstream. Why didn't you involve me earlier? And I think like part of what, what you're able to unlock is the ability to actually not necessarily do source heavy sourcing engagements for them when you've established a process that does involve you from the front. Because sometimes that, get, that leads you to the conscious decision of, okay, this is the type of deal that should be able to be self-served or doesn't need my involvement. It's lower dollar, but I have this clean process for you that's valuable enough that you're going to start at this intake point regardless. Like that's the nirvana to me is, is you're, you're at a point where you're having to say no because the value that you think you're going to derive from a certain uh, you know request uh, isn't worth your time uh, or your team's time or it could be better spent elsewhere. Now there's a couple of things I want to uh, just dig into that both of you just said. Uh, I do want to say like the uh, Rajul, what you were saying about the challenge, that's definitely something that I empathize with you know the visibility and transparency of where things are and where they are in the process is something that from a procurement per person you can just spend all of your time dealing with and you know there's so much you, you're working on so many things all at the same time it's really impossible for you to understand every single deal you're working at and where they are so um i certainly understand the pain points um you know that we're trying to solve by by talking about this from an intake perspective now at um at hopin and at canva you're both fast growing organizations, you know, and uh, hopefully, you know, at the beginning of your trajectory and your growth trajectory, even though growth has been fast so far, um, you both talked about, um, you know, setting up from a functional perspective. And one of the things that Liam, you said was you can set up a function too late, you know, set up procurement too late. I, I'd love to know from uh, both your perspectives, and maybe I'll start with Liam first, like what was, um, what did procurement want to, or what did your organization want from procurement? You know, what did they want you to be and why was there this push to let's try and professionalize procurement at this stage in our journey? Uh, I think you can hear me. I'm not sure your video just, uh, there we go. Your video yeah, came back. Right. Yeah. I just wondered what what the, the burning platform was to why procurement, why now? Yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, Hopin as a as a pre-IPO company, it's not it's not common to bring in a strategic sourcing function this early in its journey, right? Usually, it's like closer to IPO or post-IPO. People say, "Oh, we need to save money all of a sudden." Um, and so, my journey with Hopin, you know, the the first problem statement was, "Listen, we're signing a lot of contracts, but we don't know what any of this means, right? We just know we need to buy things. Um, I'm getting a lot of things to sign." But maybe we should have another set of eyes on these things to make sure that what we're signing is actually appropriate. Is it a good deal at the end of the day or a bad? Is it good for the company? And so that's how the journey with me started. Like, And the conversation was like, this is what it looks like pre-IPO to have someone like me. And this is what it looks like to hire me later, right? Yeah. 
you know, if you hire me later, I'll probably come in and say 40% on everything just on low hanging fruit because the deals are so bad. Yep. Or you can bring me in now and I'll probably save 20 to 30% on everything I touch. You know, I'll leave money on the table, but we'll, we'll save money, we'll mitigate risk, yeah. and we'll be able to get out of every contract possible because we just don't want to tie ourselves up. And so that's how the journey began is from like a, a deal perspective, good deal, bad deal, are we doing the right thing for the company? And then obviously my eyes are set on more than just sort of the deal in general, but like how do you set up the infrastructure to be sustainable long term? Um, no, thanks, Liam. And, and uh, Denari, what your kind of what was the journey for you of why procurement became important? The reason I'm asking this is it gives folks a little bit of context of like what should how should we position be positioning procurement to be um, in a way that our organization should be taking it seriously. And, and I I hesitate in using those words because I'm a big believer on procurement having to demonstrate the value rather than expecting that anybody sees what the value is. But there was obviously a reason why you, you began to professionalize uh, procurement at Canva. Yeah. Well, I, I think what you're speaking to is a little bit of a perception issue and Liam knocked it too. It's like, okay, it's time to negotiate deals. I, I want to get a better deal and not viewing what really procurement is holistically and what it can do for your organization. And that was originally why I came to Canva, I think was pain or uncertainty around the deals that were surfacing up to the executives and were being approved. and we brought in vendor for some of the, the SaaS side of, of the negotiations, but still like, you know, how do we know what a good deal is? We need an expert to come in and do this. But the reality is, is that the value that I, a Liam or me or any other procurement practitioner can bring is, yes, like there's high visibility into getting the savings and, and getting, uh, you know, deals on the scoreboard. Um, but it's the employee experience. It's the funneling. It's the process. Uh, it's the ability to enable your organization to scale that uh, probably doesn't get enough weight uh, and is really, I think, more of the value of what having procurement come in and really do an effective job does for an organization. Now, you talked about perception there, and we've, that's kind of been a common theme in the first 15 minutes or so. Um, Rajul, we had a question actually from Saheb that came in to us in advance of the conversation. Uh, and I'm going to pose this to you because you you get now to see kind of cross organization. I just wonder if there's a, a story or an example where you're seeing in your experience now procurement going from that pretty poor perception where they were able to turn it around pretty quickly. And, and, and I asked that to set kind of the after the possible. Is it possible for procurement to turn around perception quickly? No, I, I certainly think it's possible. And uh, may, maybe one example that, you know, that off, the, off the cuff that, that comes to mind is uh, a company that we started working with uh, right at the beginning of this year, so about six, six and a half months ago, uh, that's I think like 1,200, they, they might have grown a little bit by now, but like 1,200 or so employees, a technology company. Uh, and they used to have uh, this super, super manual process uh, where they were essentially sort of collecting an intake and then routing uh, between, you know, a, sort of a, a, a custom built JIRA implementation. There was some other, you know, like email and lots of Google forms and, and so forth. And uh, their average request when they actually looked at it was taking north of 30 emails uh, to actually go through the process. Uh, and a lot of the pain that they experience was was along the lines of what we've spoken about you know lack of visibility to the request or sort of unclear where something is gated there was only like like an admin had more visibility but everyone else could only see like their little piece of the of the puzzle and and the requester was of course lost because you know the average requester in the business right for indirect spend is making like zero to a couple of requests a year so they're constantly relearning this over and over uh uh you know in, in mass uh and uh, that was one where, uh, uh, you know, we, we we started working with that company about six and a half months ago. Um, uh, we got them live in 24 days um, from from start, so that was uh, that was that was easy because we, uh, you know, just sort of using templates and things like that to get going. Like we found is just much easier than trying to like polish every single piece of the of the yeah. process. Like just get get going, and you can always sort of iterate versus like having a really 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 long like heavyweight implementation cycle that then uh, that then you're, you're trying to polish. And, and the truth is you'll never perfectly polish it. I mean, it's sort of an arguably sort of asymptotic thing, right? Like it'll it'll never be perfect, uh, but it'll be good enough, uh, certainly pretty quickly. Um, and uh, uh, and we, you know, I was recently catching up with their, with their head of procurement and now they, they manage nine figures to spend every, you know, on an annualized basis through through Zip. And, uh, and uh, she's, you know, like, and getting tons of positive uh, sort of 
feedback from like, oh, like I can produce things on Slack or I can I get Slack notifications to things uh, to just even seeing simple cycle time improvements, a lot of which were candidly simply because now you can, you know, that company paralyzes six or seven steps in their flow. Uh, and that just naturally makes things go fast. I mean, that's the, that's the stupidest sort of way to make something go faster is to do multiple things at once, um, but it, you know, it works. And so uh, that's one, one good example that, that comes mm -hmm. to mind. Um, yeah, I want to just add on to that. From a transformation perspective, I often see that as being, you know, when I go into an organization from a consulting perspective and you're looking at doing a procurement transformation, it's oftentimes the simple things that make the customer experience, whether that's a stakeholder or the supplier, that, that make that an easier process, the ones that have the biggest impact. You know, it's not necessarily going in and saving the 10, 15 percent um, because a lot of the areas of the business don't care about that but they know that it takes some ages and lots of hoops to jump through to buy one thing that they buy every year. Um, and that must be procurement's fault. And the faster that you can fix that, the faster you start to change the perception of what procurement can do in other areas. No, um, and then get looped in earlier for, you know, uh, our earlier topic of discussion too. Right. Um, now, I, I do want to encourage folks, you know, if you do have any questions for the panel, please do pop them in the chat or pop them in the Q&A box and Kelly's going to be keeping an eye on that. Um, but I do want to go into kind of the second area of conversation as well, which is around balancing this, this uh, I talked about customer experience just then, like making things easier for the business while not, um, you know, proactively and uh, appropriately managing their spend. You know, we're not here just to say yes to everything. Um, so Denari, from your perspective, like when you're trying to, you're making their life easier and you're talking to stakeholders about we're here to make things easier for you, we're here to make things faster for you, but how do you balance that um, that tension that still needs to be there versus just saying yes to everything that they want to do? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's definitely the, the, the constant balance. I think a lot of it comes down to the goals, right, like in, in, in the nature of your business where, um, you know, in a scaling organization where I'm quickly hiring out, uh, you know, the, the full procurement function, I'm willing to give a little more leeway in the short term if I'm making a conscious decision that's going to lead to more long-term success and the deals are getting larger as we grow. Um, and so an example, I work with one of our um, marketing uh, affiliates managers on a, you know, basically a million dollar a year agency deal. And it was an interesting balance of just like, you know, she wants to move fast. She was expecting me to be a roadblock. I know that I've got somebody coming in with marketing expertise in a few weeks. And so very much tried to say, if you're comfortable with the price, that's fine. Here's what my benchmarks, uh, benchmarks say. It's a little bit overpriced, but I understand the need for you to go quickly. In the future, here's what, what a good engagement looks like. Um, but let me do all this heavy lifting for you through legal, through our internal processes, through finance. I'm willing to sponsor the pricing aspect of this, but let me get your alignment in the future. And so I think it's a little bit of a horse trade at times, uh, but it depends on where you're at in your journey. Because uh, you know, I've also been uh, at companies where uh, growth has reversed and all of a sudden, you know, headcounts being cut, budgets are being cut, and that's a different environment uh, and the type of tone that I'm gonna take with somebody from marketing who's overspending on a million dollar contract uh, mm -hmm. when that's somebody's that's somebody's livelihood for 100K a year somewhere else in the company that I know I can shave off. So uh, I think, it, it, you know, you've gotta understand what the outcomes that you're looking to build now and for the next 12 months and, and, and longer term are. And, and Liam, I'm gonna hand the same question over to you. How are you kind of approaching that? Yeah, I mean, I think it, we we approach it similar to how Denari described it. I mean, I think the question is difficult because it's uh, in the sense that at the end of the day, you have to be a good operator uh, as a sourcing person, right? You have to be a good people person, uh, particularly if you're in an environment where you don't have a lot of stakeholder engagement, so or if you're trying to build it. And so, from if you're leading the organization, then you have to really you have to really focus on when you hire people, people who are also good operators, not just like from a negotiation perspective, but also from an internal negotiation perspective, from a, just a business analysis perspective, being understand a lot of good EQ, which you know is not the easiest thing to hire for. And so, when you think about people and systems, you know the the requirements of people are always based on the limitation of those systems. And so, if you've got a very manual process then you've got a different hiring prof profile. You can't really focus on the EQ as much. You've got to balance that all out. But if you can, if you can build a good infrastructure that, that alleviates the administrative manual pieces, helps move things along, then I think you can focus your hiring profile on different types of people that help scale things besides saying, oh, I need a really good consultant who can just work with the business, have thick skin, let things roll off their back. 
versus, you know, the process works. Let me get a really strong negotiator through the table and let us ram this price through because we got all the stakeholder engagement we need, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, we just sort of have to balance those things out. But at the end of the day, just to, without without infrastructure systems or tools uh, to alleviate the, the people problem, you've got to rely on good operators at the end of the day. Well, and, and Liam, I don't know if you agree with this, but it's 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 also like, I think there's some level of empathy you have to take. Like, I know that my training and documentation for our end-to-end -end processes isn't where it should be. Uh, and so like, I step into their shoes and it's like, hey, yeah, you didn't engage me at the right point, but like, realistically, some of that is my fault. And so I think it also gives you a bit more authority to, hey, I, yeah, I want you to have a good experience, but like, we have a robust training program that I know you've been through. We've had this conversation before. Is a totally different place to be in, in terms of, kind of maybe focusing a little bit less on this person's experience for this particular deal um, uh, to move a little bit more upstream and say, you know what, we're going to need to negotiate this and we're going to have to put pause for a week for me to get across this because you didn't get me engaged at the right point. You didn't do X, Y, Z. Um, maybe maybe there's a little less sympathy in those scenarios. Yeah, no, I, no, I think I 90% agree with you. I think the, more, the older I get, the less empathy or forgiveness I have for certain <laughs> folks. But um. <laughs> But I definitely with you that you've got to you kind of recognize the entire situation of like what you're able to do for people and and you know people will will re remove their roadblocks or go around anything they can to get their job done at the end of the day. So you have to understand that as well. Give them three strikes and then that's where the empathy stops. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, now um, we have some questions that came in uh, related to tail spend. But before I go there, uh, Denari, something that you said actually um, probably 10 minutes or so ago was talking about, um, you know, how do you, when do you take on a, when do you take on a project from a procurement perspective or get involved in a project, you know, versus thinking about when you don't and just try and enable a 100% self-service. Like how, how do you think about when should procurement be involved versus when should we just be, giving the stakeholders, the buyers, everything that they need, you know, from a tools, a technology um, perspective, to just go and do it themselves. We don't need to get involved in it. Is it like a spend threshold or do you look at it in some other way? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I don't have an exact formula, but it, it's a materiality against my total spend. And so like what what is uh, 10 grand and less today will probably be 15 to 20 grand or less uh, a year from now, you know, at the trajectory at least that Canva's growing. So I think you gotta look at your total pie and just be like, Look, it's me grinding on this deal and cutting my teeth for, you know, if I get 20% off at, at two grand, like that feels good. Uh, but also, what would I have been able to do at this time? And, and, and that's the balance that I try to take in terms of that spend threshold. Um, and it may differ a little bit by spend type, uh, depending on kind of just the, the profile of spend that you have. Um, but the key there is like you, you have to have clear training and enablement and systems, to your point, that enable that self service to say, like, look, uh, one of the value props of procurement, in my opinion, and increasingly so as uh, approvals become more complex and teams come in, is to play that project manager hat a little bit and take some of the legal, take some of the cross-functional piece off of their plate. Um, and so you can't just say, oh, if you come through me on a big deal, I'll do that. Now the little deals, you're on your own and that's a really crappy process when I'm not doing it, right? And so you have to think about how do I actually create a similar process for them and I can step out. I wanna maintain visibility. I want to make sure it's a good customer experience, um, but I don't want to have to do any of the work myself if I'm consciously saying that my time isn't well spent here. That actually lines up with uh, someone was joking with me or, you know, on, on the same topic like a week or so ago, and he, he sort of equated uh, the, this sort of dynamic, uh, 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 you know, around sort of like his, his uh, example was, it's like, you know, it's like spending all this time hiring for a surgeon, but then the surgeon is spending 60% of his or her day like mopping the floors, right? Yeah. Which is, to Liam's point, a different skill set, uh, and and obviously you know lower leverage use use of his or her time, right? And and uh, I think a lot of this resonates. Yeah, there was a um, you know I had a conversation with the CPO of a fast-growing organization in the Bay Area probably a couple of years ago, you know, and they were talking about the fact that uh, from a our sales and uh, sorry, our software engineers, the folks who you know are costing us a quarter of a million dollars a year or half a million dollars a year or whatever the number is, uh, you know, given the inflation among salaries in that space, you know, we're paying them all this money to come in and do that job. And when they're spending, even if that's five or ten percent of their time getting stuck in broken procurement processes, that's expensive time that we can't, um, that they can't, that they're not doing their day job. 
And so for us from a value proposition, just being able to show that we're able to put processes in place, whether it's through technology and through self-enablement, or whether it's just jumping in and doing the dirty work, so to speak, you know, and just taking care of some of that stuff, that's actually a, as great of a value prop, if not more so, than any savings that they may drive because that's really what's attrib attributing to the growth. It's not whether we're gonna save 3% on something, it's how can we make these expensive uh, employees as available and focused on the job that they need to do. Um, and so, I mean, different horses for different courses for different organizations, but just interesting ways to think about the value proposition and how you can position it internally. Um, Kelly, I'm going to come to you just, I know we've had a couple of questions that have um, popped in, so uh, I didn't know if there's any you wanted to pose to the panel. Absolutely, and actually there's one that I feel is particularly critical that needs to come right to the top of the list. It's less of a question and more of a comment. Um, Rajul, we're getting a lot of positive feedback for your summer haircut. So <laughs> for, for everyone listening in later as a podcast, just Imagine the most fabulous, suitable summer haircut you can. We're getting some positive feedback, some good energy there. So, um, so glad we have you on video so that everybody can experience your your summer haircut. Um, Love it. Yeah. <laughs> to the to the point that we're here to discuss today, um, I have an interesting question from Jim, um, and maybe Denari will start with you here, and then we can go to Liam for a little bit of of input as well. What Jim is talking about is the fact that there's sometimes a dual challenge that has to be addressed. One is that procurement is thought of as being entirely tactical, right? They're not perceived as being strategic at all. And also there's the separate but connected problem of procurement wanting to move backwards in the process, right? Away from PO towards intake. If you have both of those problems in parallel, what advice uh, what recommendations would you give around how to prioritize things or maybe how to split your energy if you would try to do them at the same time? Yeah, well, I guess like I view that those are problems that uh, are very much solved with the same kind of uh, approach, which I, th I think for me, like when I come into an organization uh, and the perception of procurement is either non-existent or uh, it's really uh, to the effect of what their last job was. And it's usually their worst, they assume the worst of their entire career is maybe what you will be like the no people don't like to assume the best i guess uh at, at all times um and it's really finding a few deals that are material and champions that you can get involved with and sometimes i, I you know i try to build bridges through uh having a little bit of discovery of just what's been your prior pain making sure that they know that there's a, a you know finding my kind of key people who are spending a lot of money or having a lot of deals come through. Because what you'll find is that if you can deliver a really good experience for them and do it in a way that's very intentful with, you know, before, like, here's where I'm at, here are my goals uh, on this specific deal, here's how I'm gonna support you. And when you go deliver that experience, ask them to be a champion for you. Ask them to tell their head of a certain department about how great of an experience it is. It's a little bit awkward to ask, like, can you spread the good word about how great I am at my job? But when you do it with the intent of like, I'm trying to make an impact at this organization, and uh, I know that I can do this, I'm gonna demonstrate it here, and I would love your support to go do this elsewhere. That's what's gonna start the trickle effect of people involving you earlier in the process, and in turn, uh, kind of reverse that that feeling that you guys are order takers at the end of the day uh, and, and bringing you in because I think the, the notion that you're an order taker is because you're not at the beginning of that kind of intake process um, and the reason why you're not at that intake process is that people either don't have a predictable process and a clear process or they have a process that they don't want to follow because they don't perceive your value as good enough. Absolutely. Liam, is there anything that you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I, and I just want to make sure I understand the question correctly so just correct me if i'm if i'm off somewhere but i mean these sort of there's two things there was like how do you you know the concept of sort of going from po to intake and the first one sort of being from tactical to strategic and like how correct. do you balance the two and so it's interesting because you know i i i do an onboarding session for all the new hop in employees every two weeks right i'm a part of that onboarding session and i talk about you know what i do and what our what our position is when we buy things for the company because i can't be everywhere at all times so i try to evangelize this is our position in general but we do talk a lot a little bit about what's the difference between strategic sourcing and procurement and i never used to really care whether you called me procurement or strategic sourcing right but um it's become a little bit more important nowadays because i want to make sure that people know that i'm not 
perfect here to pay. I'm not transactional at the end of the day. You don't come to me when the deal is done, right? Mm -hmm. You come to me when you want a deal of some sort, right? And so, and that's where it needs to happen. And so if we're talking about like, why do you go from PO to, to intake or why do you go from procurement to strategic? Then we're sort of talking about two different things, right? We're talking about you know, sort of there's a whole supply chain out there and there are different components of that supply chain. And so there will always be POs, there will always be transactional things that happen in that cycle. Uh, but there's this other upstream portion that's been ignored for a long time for a lot of different companies. Uh, and, and, and if people are trying to move upstream, it's a good thing because uh, it helps everybody. Um, and to also know that it's a whole different process, right? It's not a substitute for the downstream process. It is a complementary process at the end of the day. Um, and so I think that's important to understand for a lot of people, the different thing, like the different stages in the life cycle of things. Absolutely. And actually, to your point about uh, the, the stages in the life cycle, Rajul, a question for you that I think is sort of related to what we've just been discussing. Um, Larissa's asking a question, and let me try to sort of paraphrase. So, you know, we're talking about going from intake to procure and improving, streamlining, right, increasing visibility, increasing speed. How can procurement make sure that they have sort of equal measure, speed, visibility, governance, compliance, at all of the steps in that journey between intake and procure so that you don't have, say, intake be incredibly fast and transparent, but then you hit some kind of governance wall where everybody makes sure that they're comfortable before you're allowed to go to the next step. Um, are there, you know, are there ways to focus on each of the steps in the process and then come back and look at the process to make sure that from sort of a user standpoint or a consumer standpoint in that process, it all flows and works regardless of how much of it you're aware of as you're going through. So you don't have, this is the fast part. And then this is the, the governance part where we stop it to make sure that, that this is all right. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. I think a lot of this has to do with, you know, I think when people think about like what their flow should be like and what the process should be like, I've seen like it's it's easy to over index on the edge cases and they're like oh but like in this case there might be these like three other things and so actually we, you know we need this level of oversight on every single request that goes through you know the system that's like a software request or, or whatever the case might be in uh, and 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 I think like to that end too it's very easy with a lot of uh, just unfortunately how I think a lot of the downstream transactional systems are built that you bring up this view of like, well, then people need to sort of sign off on things. And, and actually, I would argue that you might need an approval, but you also might just need someone to be eyes on, like a watcher or an alert on something. And that gives people enough comfort that they're actually okay not being in the discrete sort of flow of, of approvals, uh, uh, right? So like, I think, I, I, you know, I would sort of encourage, and I think like what, what we've now seen as sort of best practice is to like, is to only have the folks actually stepping in and approving that truly, or the teams that truly need to do that. Um, uh, and, and, and then to, to that end, like, you know, sort of around the speed of the request, um, the, the easier you sort of make the intake and, and the lighter weight it is, like the more likely candidly it is that both the sourcing and procurement functions will just be looped in earlier because you just lower the bar to push something through. If someone clicks in and they see 46 questions, they're just gonna think they're not ready yet uh, to go do it. Cause it's gonna feel like, oh wait, this is like a transactional thing now. Like I need to, you know, drop in when the contract is gonna start or X, Y, Z. And so one of the things we recommend is keep a super simple intake, 10 questions, 12 questions, maybe even less, kick it off and then have another form, another sort of set of questions that the requester or other parties in the flow need to answer that'll actually sort of live update the flow as, as people are moving through it but doesn't gate uh, uh, you know, procurement sourcing and other core teams from just starting to like get visibility into, into things that are, that are happening. Um, I don't know if that quite answered like 100% of the question because it was long and I might be missing. I know there's a, a lot to it. Well, yeah, well, no, if, maybe I could, if, if, if maybe I could jump in because I think like maybe what I read as part of the question too is maybe the, a little bit of what I view as the elephant in the room which is like privacy, security, legal who layer in these processes into the procurement process. And like, I think there's a philosophical conversation about who owns that like when we when we say intake to procure and security mandates that they need to be involved in XYZ deals and they have this arduous process that they put in, do you own that process? Is security, is it co-owned? Like who really drives it? Because I think that 
in my opinion, like I own the intake to procure process. And if you are going to layer in a process into my process and make requirements, um, I still own the deliverable of the right employee experience and the right amount of time that I need to deliver on. And so sure, you need to define where you need to be, but like I actually need to get a layer deeper to understand is your process too arduous? And there's been several times in my career where somebody comes in and they have some playbook and every vendor needs to answer these 250 questions if they're software for everything, no matter what, uh, you know, maybe from security uh, in a painful journey of, you know, do I, I got to get some benchmarking. I got to figure out who I got to align with on that side to get a more risk based approach. I feel a responsibility to go that level deeper because when I think about the number of days that I want uh, to target for an end to end uh, procure to intake, if these, if these guys are going to come in and create two weeks and my goal is two weeks, I'm never going to hit that SLA. Um, and so I don't know if that's part of the question as well. I maybe read, read a little bit of it, but it's an interesting balance for us as procurement as more people raise their hands. Rahul gave some tools about is an alert versus an approval, but there's also like there's core processes that have to happen. They should. I'm not saying security shouldn't be there, um, but more and more, uh, you know, I think people are, are playing by the book versus taking a risk based approach, which allows them to maybe do a lighter review if there's no PII or other things involved. So how can you help guide them to something that they're comfortable with that delivers the right employee experience for your organization? Kelly, any Thank, you, Tenari. Thank you very much. And I actually had I wanted to jump on that as well. So you know, you talked about the different processes or the different folks who can be involved in that process, whether it's info security, whether it's privacy. And I, I shamefully can say that I've been involved in, you know, sending the 300 questions, uh, building a third party risk management program back in the day where you basically throw out the kitchen sink at the supplier. And then you wonder why it takes them two months to respond. And when they do, nothing's usable anyway. Um, you know, as you're going through that intake process, obviously what you buy um, drives the kind of approvals that you need and the types of um, uh, you know additional assessments or due diligence that may be needed. Uh, I'm going to pose this uh, first um, to you, Denari, and then I'm going to come to Liam. You know, how do you think? How are you managing like what goes where? I'm buying this, and therefore this is going to be a really straightforward process, and it's only going to need check the box one approval versus it's got PII and it's going to need to go to five different places, and you know, kind of distributing that. Yeah, I, it's a it's a fun exercise of the growing web of things, um, you know, because I think like you're going to start from a pretty solid place, which like for me is new new contracts need legal. Hopefully, if there's an existing MSA, there's some conditionality that I can skip legal. Like that tends to be kind of bread and butter. And um, where it gets more nuanced is like yeah, like privacy. We're a B two C company, so privacy is a big focus for us. And um, you know, we have these big privacy impact assessments, and the laws are changing, transfer impact assessments, and it's all over the place. And you know that would create a really bad process if any time there's PII, it's that. And so, like, what I would like to start with is just when do you want to be involved and how do you want to be involved? Is it an alert versus an approval, and what's the action? Um, and usually that's a bit over-indexed, and so that's where I try to push a layer deeper to say, okay, so are all things that hit what you just defined the same level of risk for our organization? Do they have the same penalties, uh, the same customer brand reputation? And that's where I'm able to unpeel things a little bit more to say, like. No, like if it's just PII, but it doesn't hit any of these eight categories, then we'll just get a data processing addendum and I don't need to talk to you. Okay, great. That's 80% of my requests. And so that's kind of how I try to piece it together. And then where it goes in the workflow is really for me a question of where is the debt? What data do you need to do your review? And where do I want to collect that data from the mm -hmm. intake or the requester, the vendor? And, and it's nice, like, you know, we're, we're a customer of Zip and having that flexibility to choose where you collect information from what party is a whole different ball game than, you know, what I'm used to, which is here, here's 70 questions up front and eventually somebody's going to need that field when I think we talked about it. The reality is most people don't have all that information at that point in time and it probably shouldn't be coming from the requester for everything that you're asking. Yeah, ours is ours is similar in the sense that I mean, obviously we're going to use Zip and and we're going to push out the conditional questions to lead people to where they need to go. And I, I mean, I think increasingly, you know, it's very it's very rare these days that I would say something can rely on POTs and Cs to move forward, right? I mean, because every, almost everything has some sort of data element involved now, and so you've got your typical actors in everything we do, whether it be legal, privacy, um, security, sort of the core. Um, but then it's all those other sort of ancillary ones that you forget about whether insurance terms were, you know, not the right ones or, you know, some, you know, employment law in some respects. And so 
it's important to have, uh, an, again, an infrastructure and a system that allows for that automation because, that, again, if you don't have it, you've got to rely on sort of a, a special kind of person to remember the checklist, right? Yeah. Or make them print off a checklist and put it on their desk and say, hey, did you check all these things like, like we used to back in the day? So, or I need to do this, 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 this to push it through. So definitely conditional questions to move things around and get to the right people, which is ultimately helpful for people like us because then we can say, hey, it's not with me. You know, it's with, you You can clearly see it's with security. It's not with me anymore. Mm -hmm. um, or it's with legal and things. And we just, we just need to shepherd that process ultimately at the end of the day. Um, now, I lost my train of thought. I was going to ask a question that follows on on that, but um, let me come to, let's see, we've got 10 minutes, 12 minutes left. So if anybody else has got any other questions, please feel free just to pop them in the question, the Q&A or the chat, and Kelly is going to continue to um, to take a look at that. One of the questions that we got in um, beforehand, and, and Liam, I'm going to ask you this first, uh, was from Amit. And Amit was talking, we've talked a lot about internal satisfaction with stakeholders. Um, how do you think about tracking stakeholder satisfaction you know do you track it if you do how do you track it or at least how any advice on the things that we could be thinking about to be able to start tracking that to see if we're making improvements in how we're changing the perception of procurement through this intake to procure process yeah that one is a little bit um i'm probably the wrong person to ask that question only because i hate to ask stakeholders what their perception is of of what i do mm -hmm. um, I, I have a couple of thoughts around it right i mean if you're at a, again at an organization where you're trying to get stakeholder engagement, then again it's it's more about whether or not people like you versus whether or not you're delivering anything right. Mm -hmm. And then it's sort of a little bit of a game to send a sort of surveys to people you know who like you. Yeah. But I think it also puts you it, it also puts sort of procurement and people in the mindset if like your if your uh, personal sort of goals and objectives and reward system is based on how well your stakeholders like you, then in some sense you're really not doing your job, right? Because there's always a, going to be a little tension there because we're always going to recommend things that the business doesn't like. So, And that's how we end up getting into a world where we just paper agreements because we're essentially just agreeing to whatever the stakeholder wants us to go and buy for them. They're like, okay, the deal's done. Can you paper, paper it quickly? And all of a sudden, you've got a great stakeholder engagement score and people like you, right? And so, you know, I like to think of my job as, as helping the business do the best bad deal possible at the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. and, and telling them these are the things you're doing wrong if I don't agree with them. I was like, I'll help you do it to get your job done. This is what you believe you need to do. And, and if I think it's horrible, I'll let them know. I think that if I think they're being stupid, I'll tell them they're being stupid. But listen, I'll still help you. But mm -hmm. I think I see that as a factor of my a factor and a core requirement of what I do as a function. Um, and I don't expect people to like me. Right. I expect I expect to deliver on results on risk mitigation. I, you know, as a function, we'll always deliver on savings and cost avoidance It's sort of like I just expected at the end of the day. Um, and and from us, if, if people want to judge like on how easy the process was, then I, I think that's completely legitimate. Right. Like, I don't think company wide anybody should create processes or um, obstacles for people that are unnecessary. So I think that if from a from a judgment and criteria, I'm all for sending surveys and say, hey, did the system and process work for you? Yeah. Did you like me or not? I'm a little bit more against like, did you like me or not perspective? Mm -hmm. But um, but you know, is me aside, did everything else work the way it right. should have worked? Then I'm totally yeah. good with that. Yeah, because um, I guess like I, I, that, that resonates a bit because it's like the the do I like you is almost a, a pre input to the real measures of. PO compliance, spin under management, all the things that you want to eventually go to of like, yeah, if you're doing really shitty in those areas, probably uh, there might be a sentiment issue that, that you can somewhat help fix, but not like solve. Like I'm not trying, an, an MPS of 10, of whether you like me as a negotiator or the support that I'm giving is, I, I think like that would be cool if I could measure that, but, but I don't. Um, but I'm more focused on the results and then finding out why. And I think, um, you know, maybe Rahul can talk about it too, but like one of the things is like the system and the process is a big focus because that's where people will lay in and they'll actually give you actionable feedback that will create a better experience. And so I think like from a zip perspective, we had them build a Slack integration that at the end of every approval request sends a quick form to, to, to ask those questions because that's what I can iterate quicker to get that adoption and end up with uh, the real KPIs that I want. Yeah, with what Denari said, we, we recently uh, uh, launched an optional sort of survey, like a very quick survey at the end. So when something is fully uh, approved, the requester gets a Slack message from the Zipbot that says, hey, 
how to go, they can click in the you know click on the link and like answer a couple of questions and uh, and then we share that uh, uh, with with customers and so there's a lot of interesting feedback around you know these are some of the things that maybe weren't clear to me or just a lot of like process things that we can make you know hopefully iterate iterate the flows and, and zip to just make things smoother and, and better going going forward so uh, uh, that's something that so far has worked well. And I wanted to say like that, do I like you question that that uh, Liam and Denaro that you both said such a dangerous question because you know I feel like on one one hand we're we're always trying to have our stakeholders like us. It goes back to that perception. I think this is like a psychology of the procurement person in terms of wanting to feel as though you're adding value and often so much we don't feel we are. And so there's this pursuit of they, that my stakeholder likes me, but your stakeholder can like you because you say yes to everything they ask you to do. And if you're saying yes to everything that you ask that they're asking you to do, that means that you're truly playing a tactical or, or transactional role. You're not challenging. You're not bringing insights. You're not cha you know helping to challenge the status quo. Um, and you're not going to have people saying that they they like you all the time if you're coming to maybe let, make their life a little bit more difficult because you're bringing different perspectives. Um, well said, uh, Rahul. I've got a question around. Um, so we've looked at uh, you know bringing in place a a tighter more streamlined intake to procure process you know something that um, it, it, we've talked about how do we measure that you know from a stakeholder perspective um, you're again working across a number of different organizations how are you seeing organizations looking at you know what the ROI of investing the time and the energy to bring all these different disparate approval processes into one end-to-end -end process, like what does success look like, and what do you hear that that folks are, how folks are measuring success of doing that? Yeah, great, great question. It's it's a couple of couple of metrics, right? One, like a simple one, is cycle times, uh, right? And being a, candidly for the first time, being able to actually clearly report on what the cycle times that even are. Uh, mm -hmm. itself is sort of part of it, uh, right? Because, uh, you know, unfortunately it's so fragmented that it's actually hard to compute uh, uh, some of that. Um, but that, so that's one sort of simple uh, metric. Another one is, you know, if if the sourcing or and the procurement functions are looped in too late, <clears throat> it's often, or it can unfortunately often be at a point where, you know, the vendor thinks they're already getting the business, you're not in a leveraged position to be able to, to negotiate or really even change any of the, a lot of core terms, pricing being one thing, uh, and then payment terms being in a, being another thing, right? Like a lot of the fundamental terms. And so, if you get looped in earlier, you can actually start to, in an automated sense, be able to see, oh, so where did we like, what did, where did we start at on this request, and then where did we, where did we end? Uh, and do that in an automated way, even for for deals that aren't like super heavyweight, like deals that you're going to like run, you know, there's like sourcing events and spend a lot of time on because candidly, a lot of the spend uh, that's going through the system is not, is not sort of spent in that way, sourced in that way. Um, so it just allows you to sort of increase leverage, get looped in earlier and then sort of track uh, uh, sort of savings uh, across the board, even for things that are just sort of minimal, but, you know, shavings make up a pile, so to, so to speak, right, around that. And then the other is, um, you know, for the first time, having consistent auditability across all, like, great example, right? Is all the software we're buying going through the right security reviews? Yeah. In the past, people, there, there was no clear, confident answer to that because uh, there's a large security team, but like, who knows that everything is actually going through the team that needs to go through that through that team, right? For example, and and now for the first time, there's a clear auditable record uh, of this, and we can see, you know, what percentage of XYZ types of requests are actually going through, you know, a certain tier of TPRM review, for for example. Mm -hmm. So that's that's super super valuable from a compliance and a risk mitigation standpoint. Um, and and I'll pose the question, Liam, is that how you look at things as well in terms of the success of bringing all these together, or are you looking at other measures as well, like other value measures? Yeah, I, d I definitely would piggyback on what Jules said. I mean, that visibility around how long things take, cycle time per segment, like from a total supply chain perspective, is always um, super meaningful to me because then we can we can really dive into sort of what's the problem at the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when you can break down that cycle time, and I think for se success, sort of when you, when you're going back to sort of limitations of systems, requirements of people. I'm always trying to figure out, you know, how do I how do I make myself really sort of 
irrelevant at the end of the day to yeah. some extent, right? Um, because, you know, not everybody, you know, depending on spend and size of the company needs strategic sourcing as a function, but procurement as a, like a process is always needed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, can we determine based on the process and how things flow, how relevant do I need to be in this company? If that system can work Can that machine work, can yeah. the machine should be able to exist without me. And then people can say, all right, now we've got this incredible process flow that has addressed security, it's addressed legal, it's addressed mis risk mitigation as a whole, the things that accounting needs to process everything, even if it costs way too much, if everything is covered, right? Um, is it flowing through the right way? Then people could say, all right, now we need strategic people, people who really perform at that high level engagement level as consultants in the company to say, listen, if you're going out to buy, you know, marketing automation, if you're going to buy media advertising, if you're going to go buy, you know, cloud services, you can really focus on SMEs who focus on that area and say, this is how you approach the market. This is how you buy. This is how you leverage if it's meaningful at the end of the day. But again, sort of say, do you have the infrastructure to allow you to do that? Because otherwise you're just stuck, you know, doing the, uh, yeah, doing the pushing same. paper back and forth. Yeah. Um, and last word to Denari, how uh, how have you looked at success or measured success of bringing all this together? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, six months into building out the function and a couple months live on Zip. And so like the focus right now and what I would say is success is just adoption from end users uh, of the tool itself. But I think like what having that, like that visibility is key because I have all the data. I have how long security is taking, how long legal is taking, how long my end-to-end -end process is taking, the variability when I'm involved versus not. Um, and so I think like I feel very well prepared that come three months from now when uh, we're a little bit better resourced and we have a little bit uh, more uh, you know, uh, coverage in terms of the types of spend coming through, that I'm gonna be able to really narrow in on what, what the right measures of success are. Because I think it's different for every organization. And, to Rahul's point earlier, you, you just don't have that visibility when you're using a ticketing system or bolting on something or manual emails into that full end-to-end -end process and the pieces within it. Yeah. Um, well, I know that I have a, a ton of other follow-up questions I could have jumped in to, to make the conversation go even further, but we've spent the good path of an hour kind of um, on the AP Live. So I want to thank, first of all, Kelly, thank you for keeping an eye on the questions um, in the background and the chat. Um, and uh, Rahul, Denari, Liam, thank you very much for joining us on the panel, uh, and everybody for joining us in the uh, um, in the Goto webinar. Just uh, appreciate the questions we got. So many of them in advance. We tried to cover uh, the intent of as many of them as we possibly could, um, as, but uh, always here to answer any other questions after the fact if you have them. So, thank you everybody, everybody very much for joining us today. I want to thank you for listening into today's episode of the Art of Procurement. To go deeper, including access to transcripts and actionable outtakes from the podcast, join the free level of our AOP Mastermind community. To learn more, go to artofprocurement.com slash mastermind. And to find our entire back catalog of almost 400 episodes, go to artofprocurement.com slash podcast.